joined by Jerry Gibbons. We had such a positive reaction last time to uh, his appearance. We decided to bring him back for round two. So Jerry, thanks again for coming back uh, and joining us. And today, kind of the same thing. Uh, I look into uh, what we are being in our day-to-day -day interactions. You know, that's ranging from communication ethics to you know, awareness of individual sensibilities, you know, introversion versus extroversion, um, you know, including you know, aligning our actions with our personal core values. And today, uh, much like last time, I uh, give you kind of a new awareness and new language when it comes to uh, self-accountability, both in life and the workplace. And before Jerry gets uh, kicked off, just a couple, uh, you know, as the you know, technical director here, I have to give just a couple of technical uh, outlines. Um, please uh, mute all your microphones. Uh, you, we, we only want to hear Jerry. Jerry's the star of the show here. So uh, maybe afterwards, if you have any questions, we'll, uh, you could come off mute and ask. And then if you wanted to say, you can keep your camera on, or you can certainly uh, disable your camera. Uh, we have Jerry spotlighted here, so you should be able to just see him and any uh, uh, screen sharing uh, features he wants to show. If you want to hide all the boxes, the gallery view, if you want to see, if you don't want to see those, uh, just real quick, if you go to the up arrow next to your camera and video settings, uh, there's going to be a box that pops up and towards the bottom, it'll say hide non-video participants. So I'll take away all those black boxes with names in it. And with that, uh, Jerry, thanks again for joining us and please take it away. Thank you so much for having me again. I'm really excited to be back and to share this program, Mindfulness and Business. Um, as I'm getting it on screen for you, I'll kind of explain why I came up with this, like where this information came from and all that good noise. <laughs> so I have been a teacher of yoga and meditation for the last 12-ish years, a little bit more. And in that time period, I have worked in business. I have run culture at tech companies, offices. I ran a, a yoga studio back in Michigan where I'm from. I worked in uh, hospitality for like eight years. And so my early years in studying mindfulness and meditation and yoga were really about how to integrate my core values and how I look at the world through the lens of meditation and yoga and mindfulness into my day-to-day -day interactions. And so over time, I've developed <laughs> more language for it. I've found a lot of information out there in the world that already exists that I can bring to the table and help other people who are also trying to incorporate these mindsets into their daily life, how you can bring that into the workplace. Um, so this includes some uh, mindfulness technique type stuff, some, some stuff from like the Buddhist tradition, from the yogic tradition. It also leans into some psychology as well. So I try to pair them together and make it a nice, nice little package here. So we're gonna go ahead and begin. All right, so this is my, my little bio here. I think I just said most of this. <laughs> I do specialize in corporate wellness because of my background in, in working in business. I'm also a life coach and I'm also a published author. The book here to my left here, Essential Pranayama, is my latest book. Um, and this is my information if you wanna get hold of me. So the word mindfulness is brought up a lot in consciousness communities and circles, and it's used kind of uh, liberally. So at a, for a certain point, it really doesn't have a definition anymore because of how it's kind of thrown around. And so I want to ground what we're talking about when I say mindfulness here. And that is the present awareness of your thoughts, emotions, your speech, your actions, um, and their effect on the world around you and how the world around you affects you. So it's your relationship to the world. Um, and to yourself as well. And so mindfulness in business, you can improve your relationships, um, your business relationships, your, your relationship with your colleagues, with your bosses, with your subordinates, um, to make you even more effective. But before we do that, let's take a mindfulness moment. So just a really quick meditation to help ground us into where we are in this moment. So if you feel comfortable, go ahead and close your eyes. With your eyes closed, just take a deep breath in and out. This is a quick mindfulness meditation. Feel your feet on the ground, your seat in the chair. Your body resting here. any comforts or discomfort that might come with that awareness. 
of your body resting here. Noticing your breath, your breath in your nostrils, at your throat, your body expanding and contracting as the lungs fill and empty. And as you turn your awareness towards your mind, I want you to ask the question, Who's here? Who's here as you right now? Are you playing a role? Maybe it's the role you have in your, in your job. There might be a couple of split roles. Being at home, maybe you're, there's a parent there as well. You're being a parent and you're working. In other words, asking the question, who are you being right now? It's helpful to know where we're at, what capacities or functions that we're acting through. And then whatever role you're playing right now, whatever awareness you're with right now, so whether to be maybe a curiosity that comes forward, some receptivity to what I might share with you. Maybe there's a couple of points that feel important or novel that you want to remember, but allowing you to step into that receptive mode. And then taking a deep breath in and out. Allow your eyes to softly open, bring yourself back to the space around you and back to our presentation. Even that, just a little bit of a moment can help shift where you're at. And a lot of what we're gonna be talking about today is like who we're being in a moment. So that's kind of why I wanted to, to ground in with that right now, make it present for you. So the first thing I wanna talk about here is who I'm being versus what am I doing? <laughs> um, sometimes we get caught up in autopilot or that we feel so focused on the action that needs to be completed that we kind of just throw caution to the wind that we don't really care or are, we don't find ourselves concerned about how we're being or who we are being as we are completing those actions. So mindfulness asks us to look at who we are being from moment to moment so that we don't ever get far enough away from our values or our morals or the ethics of the systems that we exist within um, so that we don't feel like regret or we don't hurt somebody's feelings or that we can be mindful of how other people might be feeling. So a couple of questions to always ask is who am I being right now or is who I'm being right now aligning with my values and my intentions? Am I trying to be a kind person? Am I, is my intention really to not cause suffering to other people around me or to my kids or to my partner? And then another question is, is who I am being helping or improving the situation? Sometimes we get so results oriented that we realize that the person on the other end actually can't hear us because they're now in a defensive mode. So this is a lot about ownership of who you are being and what are you are doing in a moment. And we'll talk about the other side of that coin, which is the other person you're communicating with. But uh, this is the core to what we're talking about today. So top is a conversation that we'll cover. Uh, sensibilities and communication. So a little bit of uh, psychology styles and communication styles. We want to talk about expectations that we have and then the reality around that. And then some mindful behavior, things you can do to help strengthen that mindfulness muscle within your mind. All right, sensibilities and communication. The words you speak become the house you live in. What you speak, how you are being in the world, it really creates the conditions that you exist within from a moment to moment basis. So it's about intentionality at the end of the day. This is a quote from Hafiz. Okay, so I didn't mention earlier, but I'll mention it now. 
<laughs> that uh, when I was in college, I actually studied organizational communication. So I feel like a lot of this is coming full circle for me right now, where I'm blending mindfulness with the things I actually studied in college. Um, so mom, I am using my degree. You're welcome. So the question here is, am I communicating with this person in a way that they are receptive to what I'm saying? Will they be receptive to what I'm saying or will they be defensive? So this is mainly talking about conflict resolution or when you need to kind of broach a tough, tough subject with someone that sometimes we can get into um, like a blame game and we can really uh, start to alienate ourselves from the people that we're trying to communicate with. So let's talk more about that. So if you were in the last talk that I had, I talked about the nervous system a lot and I'm going to talk about it again. So basically, there are two nervous system responses. And the one that we're all most familiar with is your fight or flight response, or what's more, com or, uh, more scientifically known as is the sympathetic nervous system response. And that's the urge to fight, to flee, to freeze, collapse. There's even a new one that they added to that called tend and befriend, where when you feel threatened, you try to make friends with the thing that's threatening you. <laughs> so this is a stress response and it is completely biological. The amygdala, the center of the brain gets triggered and your frontal, prefrontal cortex shuts down. So basically your rational mind goes away. Physically and chemically, this makes the person who you're trying to communicate with less able to even be receptive because they're in defense mode at that moment. So everything you're saying to them, they're actually contemplating retorts to what you're saying instead of feeling like they're being called in. So this is an important part of your system. I never wanna shame the sympathetic nervous system because it will save you from imminent danger, but we need to be aware of in ourselves when it comes up so that we can take steps to step back from it when it's not needed. And then also be aware of when it's present for other people. So that's that. Um, the other side of the coin for this is the parasympathetic nervous system, which is that calm, grounding, rest and digest response, um, which we won't spend a lot of time talking about specifically, especially right now, because the fight or flight response is the one that's going to come in the most when we are trying to have some of these tough conversations. So ways to know if somebody might trigger into their sympathetic nervous system is just knowing the person a little bit more. And you may not always have this luxury, but when we're in business settings, we tend to have an understanding, at least generally, of the people that we're communicating with. So understanding, is this person an introvert or is, are they an extrovert? And knowing that that's not a polarization so much as where do they fall on the scale between the two? Do they have a preferred communication style? That's good to know. Maybe direct confrontation in person is actually quite threatening to them and they'd rather get like an email telling them what's going to happen before they get to it. Um, I think we've all gotten like the text or the email that's like, hey, can we talk with no context? <laughs> we know what that does to our minds. It, it, it puts us in this like questioning, defensive, sympathetic nervous system response. We start to like think, did I do something wrong? So keep that in mind as we go along too. Um, and then also understand what has proven to be effective or not effective in the past. When we're just focused on getting out what needs to be said, we might not realize that this is not the most effective way to communicate with this person or this body of people. And the great news is that you can actually just ask the person. It doesn't have to be a mind reading exercise. You can say like, hey, what is the best way for me to communicate with you, especially if you are the boss and you know, you're trying to communicate with, with a subordinate. So yeah, understand the person. Okay, so in my research around communication, I came across a Sufi uh, style of communicating that the goal is it encourages conscious communication for harmony. And that the, the promise of this, this idea is that if you follow these steps, you will cause no suffering to yourself or anyone else. So keeping all of this in mind um, as you're communicating. So, and again, I want to I make sure that you know this is a practice that I don't expect you to walk away from today's presentation and say like, oh, I really messed up at that step. I, I should have done that this way. This is a moment to moment practice. You're going to fail at this. You're going to succeed at this. Be gentle with yourself in that. All right. So there are four gates 
of communication in this, in this idea. And the idea is that if you allow your communication, and I say speech here, but I really mean any form of communication, whether it's an email, a text, you're on the phone, you're in person, you allow it to pass through each one of these checkpoints sequentially before you let it out completely. <laughs> so the first question is, is it kind? The second is, is this true what I'm saying? Is it necessary that I communicate this? And is now the right time to communicate this? And I'm gonna talk about these each a little bit more specifically. Okay, is it kind? Checking in with yourself, and this is again, that like, who am I being right now? Like, I, I wanna make an assumption real quickly that none of us really wanna cause suffering to other people. I'm just making that assumption here. And so that really drives kindness to the front of the line when it comes to communicating mindfully. So are you attempting kindness? Check in with yourself. Is that my intention here? Is there another kinder way to say this than what the first draft in my head or on this email is? Are you reacting uh, to harm without knowing it? Like, is there unconscious revenge that's, that's playing out? Um, are you reacting to a time when somebody else has done this to you in the past or has made you feel this way in the past? Um, again, are you, is your intention to cause no harm? And the idea here is that if you can't say something nice, then you're not ready to, to say it or you're not the one to communicate it. Um, and this ensures tact in the conversation. And I'm gonna go back a slide really quickly just to like label something specifically for you is that in this model, kindness actually comes before truth. And that is because you wanna make sure that you're, you're keeping it pure, <laughs> um, that you're not just telling the blunt truth without taking the other person's uh, sensibilities into consideration. So it, this, this is, that's what I mean when it says, it ensures that there's tact in the conversation is when you're leading with kindness. And that leads us to the second gate or the second checkpoint, which is what I'm saying actually true. And sometimes there's like some black and white truth there, like clearly this is true, clearly this is not true. But often we are making a lot of assumptions about what is true for the other person. We know there are different perspectives. So sometimes what is true for us may not be true for the person we're trying to communicate with, or they might not be aware of something. Um, what is the bigger, more objective truth? You know, sometimes we can come to a conversation thinking that something that we're saying is the most important thing in the world, but we might not realize that there's actually some bigger understanding to be had there. Um, this third one is pretty important as well. Own what's true for you without assigning blame. There's a way to communicate that states your needs, that states what's true for you without making the other person wrong. There's this binary in, uh, I think, Western cultures where we kind of, in being right, have to make the other person wrong in conversation or in conflict. And the truth is, is that, you know, we can, be, we can both be right in our own ways. And can we just state the facts and can we not attack um, when we're communicating? And this last point here is avoid absolute words. So best, worst, always, and never. It's like you never make it to work on time. <laughs> you're the worst person or like you're the worst at this. Like that's usually never true. And I know I'm using an absolute word in, in, in making my point here. Um, but very rarely do we find people on absolute ends of a spectrum. So it, it, the words you can use is like sometimes. Like sometimes you come in and you're, you're, you're like this or sometimes you act like this and I feel this way about it. Um, when we go into using best and worst and always and never or other absolute words, these are words that do trigger people's um, sympathetic nervous systems. Because we've all had that conversation or that argument with somebody and we're like, you're always like this. And they're like, and they, the respond is like, I'm not always like this. And then we have to explain, that's not what I meant. So do that, do that work in, internally before you, uh, you let it out. So after truth is necessity. Is it necessary to respond or speak at this moment? Is, it like, is this something that actually has to be shared? Or is it something within you that, you know, you might want to be like a, you want to get it out or you want to attack the person and like this just feels like the right way to do it. Um, so yeah, is it necessary, necessary to respond or speak? 
sometimes in uh, in other lectures and other opportunities that I get to speak in front of people, I talk about reactiveness versus responsiveness, and I want to differentiate those really quickly. Reactiveness is when you uh, you answer the catalyst, whatever it might be, whatever might be bugging you that somebody said, for example, without thinking about what you're saying. You just say it without allowing it to go through these gates, without really allowing yourself to process your feelings around it. You just retort. And responsiveness, um, kind of an, under the umbrella of responsibility, you actually do take time to process how you're feeling and to respond in a way that people can hear what you're saying. And it's more likely for that person or those people to be responsive to you in turn. So under the umbrella of is it necessary, you can also ask yourself, are you the right person to give this feedback and communication? If somebody is your peer and you know, you have this urge to hold them accountable for something, but you're really not their authority figure, it might be important to actually go through a certain chain of command to help this person understand any faux pas that they've made. Um, another question to ask is, will resolution and change be made by speaking? Am I just attacking? And, that's, and of course, I'm being kind of ultimate with my words right now. Um, am I just attacking or am I just trying to pry? Am I just trying to insert myself into somebody else's business? Like, is it important for me to be, sorry, I kind of skipped around a little bit. It's important for me to be the one to, to say this. And will anything actually happen by me saying it? Things to think about. Yeah, just because you think it doesn't, <laughs> wait, just because you think it doesn't mean it will, it, uh, will be helpful to communicate. I'm trying to just remember what I meant to say by that. That looks like a typo. We'll move on, we'll come back to it. All right, so the fourth gate, <laughs> I apologize. The fourth gate is now the right time to say it. Because sometimes you do need to talk to somebody and it is necessary and it is true and you do mean well, but it might not be like the right moment in time to broach the subject. You know, um, bringing up a tough topic at 5 p.m. when everybody's heading out, out of the door might not be the best time to bring up a really intense subject at work. Um, conversely, like first thing in the morning when somebody's like putting down their stuff and you kind of want to bombard them with all this information, maybe wait till they're in a space that's a little bit more receptive. So is now the right time to communicate this? Um, you can ask yourself, is this person in a space or place where they can be receptive? We know that we are more complicated beings than uh, we tend to let on. And as I was talking earlier or leading you through earlier, where we have all these different roles and hats that we wear in our lives, you know, somebody coming in who is a parent might have had a really tough morning and they might not be in a place they can be receptive right away. And you can ask people and the more that you create a um, harmonious interpersonal relationship with other people, the more you'll be able to trust and know when the time is right. Are you attempting punishment or retaliation with non-timeliness? You know it's the wrong time, so you're going to throw it at them so that they have to stew in it for a while. You know, think about these things. Um, and are you setting your agenda higher than their well-being? If they're not in a place where they can be receptive and you spring this information on them or broach this topic with them, you could be setting them at a disadvantage. And again, this is all about will this trigger into their sympathetic nervous system and will they be able to be responsive to you? Will they just shut down and become defensive or will they not? So yeah, some notes on the four gates. Again, the gates, and they're kind of sequential, kindness, truth, necessity, timeliness. The goal is to cause no suffering to yourself or others. Um, and it takes determination, self-accountability, compassion, and self-forgiveness to practice this. As I mentioned earlier, you will falter at this and that's fine, but keep on practicing, stay engaged with this and use these as a guideline, not as like a law that you have to follow so much. And at the end of the day, if you don't only make it through two of these gates, you're doing well, you're doing well. If you just get through kindness and truth, you're well on your way, you're well on your way. Um, I have one more slide here. <laughs> In this practice, you'll see yourself and others more clearly. You'll improve your relationships with other people. Um, and you'll also find that your communication 
will become just more effective because you'll become more streamlined in how you want to communicate with people. You'll know your intention. You'll know that what you're saying is true. You'll know that it's the right time and that this is the right topic to bring up with this person. Now, I do want to create just a little bit of disclaimer here that in instances of extreme manipulation, abuse, or excessive narcissism or abuse of power in the other person, this might be difficult to employ. So this is meant to be used in a normal <laughs> conversation manner. But if there's anything going on around you or within you that keeps you from doing this for personal safety, you can use that barrier. You can, keep, you can keep that barrier up. You can speak your truth and not be so concerned about that because sometimes if there's big stuff going on, you, know, you have to keep yourself safe first. Um, but also knows what that line is because if there is just a simple power imbalance like boss and employee, it can still be, it can still be effective for both parties. So power imbalance is different than any kind of like manipulation or abuse of power. So that's my little disclaimer there, not to get all real about it. All right, so <laughs> some, some more uh, ideas around communication. Just These are just some pointers here. I'm not gonna go through these in any uh, vivid detail. But think about speaking slowly, enunciate clearly, allow yourself to actually listen to other people. Um, often when we are supposed to be listening to other people, we're actually creating responses in our own head. So try to be as present with what they're saying, even if it slows the conversation down. Um, I, so flip, I flip these around a little bit. Uh, listen to yourself. So really know what's true for you. And that's kind of going through the four gates. Allow silence to be a part of speech. You know, if it takes you a moment to come up with a response, it might, this will feel awkward at first, of course, but over time, like you'll actually invite that silence in there. I would rather personally in a a uh, regular conversation, somebody pause for a moment, really think about what they want to say and then respond versus them having to come up with the quickest response as quickly as possible. And then speak concisely. How can I get what I need to say across with the fewest amount of words as possible? So just some communication pointers. All right, I'm gonna take a drink of tea. I'm honoring the silence in our communication. <laughs> so the next thing I want to talk about is expectations versus reality. And again, this goes back to being mindful, especially as you're in business practices. So false projection. I love talking about false projection. <laughs> um, when you are in relationship with people in a business context, it's important to ask yourself, what false relationship dynamics are you unintentionally putting on the people around you? because often we play out existing and old dynamics unintentionally. And usually that's because these patterns already exist. We do it subconsciously and it creates familiarity. It creates safety. And one of the best examples of this is how a boss to employee relationship could easily play out like a parent child relationship. Um, and that goes in both directions. Our bosses, they don't need to act. They don't need to be surrogate parents for us and our direct reports don't need to be our children. So noticing that if you are say a boss to someone um, and you start getting frustrated because they're not doing what you're saying or they're not understanding, yet you have young children at home, you might respond to both of them in similar ways and really checking yourself and understanding that that's actually not what's happening here and allow that boss employee relationship or whatever that relationship might be to be its own individual uh, entity. It doesn't have to be what you went through with your parents. <laughs> it doesn't have to be you as a parent or a child now. Um, and it also gives some grace to both parties. Um, okay, I'm just like skipping around making sure I know where I'm at in my conversation here. <laughs> so one thing I want to make sure is that, so I, I'm a life coach, I mentioned that earlier. I had a client about a year ago who was having a really hard time with her boss. And I, I sat with her and I asked her, you know, probing questions as I do to understand what the issue might be and to not go into all of her detail. But at the end of the day, we realized that she was projecting responsibility onto her boss that she didn't get from her mom. And this was completely subconscious. She didn't realize what's going on. There was no uh, negligence 
from her. But once we were able to name that that was the dynamic that was playing out, her relationship with her boss changed instantly. And so sometimes just sitting down and understanding like, why am I actually reacting to this? Why am I feeling this way? Is this related to some, some other similar dynamic I have in my life? Um, it can be that simple to shift sometimes. Um, assigning responsibility. So you need to understand what is your work to do and what's theirs. So this kind of plays back to the, to the last slide. So um, understanding like false associations. So in assigning responsibility, you need to know what is know what is in your history that you're reacting to and not just the surface and what's to blame. And so there's a, an adage in Buddhism that says, when the Buddha feels one arrow, you feel a thousand. So somebody <laughs> shoots an arrow at the Buddha and they just feel that one prick. And when somebody shoots it at us, who are not the Buddha, we feel every time we've been shot with an arrow in the past. And so there's this, this feeling of being overwhelmed that like the world's out to get us and we keep feeling attacked when really what may have happened between you and one person in that one singular incident doesn't have to be you reacting to every time you've been hurt in the past. So knowing what's true and what's not true, these are all kind of weaving together a little bit. Um, so conversely, it's good to know what their work is to do as well. So your history is yours to manage, but often uh, there are ch uh, changes that need to ma be made outside of you, processes and policies. So one time I was working at a tech company, I was running culture, and I did a little bit of like HR stuff and orientation, and I went on vacation. And they didn't tell me that a new person was starting while I was away. And I came back and I found out that there were some things that happened and it wasn't a smooth entry for that new person that was starting while I was gone. And I was mad. I was mad. As mad as I can get, I don't actually get too outwardly angry, but I was, I was upset. And I did send some emails that I probably could have revised. And, I can't, and so I, I went and did my own self work because I was feeling reactive. And that's what I do is when I feel that way, it's like I go inward and I feel, I figure out what's happening. And I realized that like I had felt ignored in my, in my past before or looked over or neglected. And I won't go into my whole history around that. <laughs> um, and so I owned that, that was my history. But what also needed to happen in that moment is that processes and policies at that company needed to change so that these incidences where somebody might be forgotten about in their, uh, in their onboarding could be fixed so that that didn't happen again. And so I came back to my bosses and to my team uh, after I did my processing and I'm like, okay, I apologize for any outbursts I had. Also, we need to fix this policy so that this, this doesn't happen in the future. So that's an example of how you can take ownership of what's yours, but still push ownership onto the systems and individuals who hold the power to actually change that. So constructive. Assumptions. I love assumptions. So asking yourself, what assumptions are you making about the people around you? So we can tell ourselves all kinds of stories. And again, this goes back into our own psychology and our own history. Um, you can ask yourself, uh, do you assume the beliefs and feelings of somebody else? So saying like, my boss just hates me. Like nothing I do can, is perfect. My boss just hates me. And because of that assumption, we might say again, my boss hates me, so I'm going to be defensive toward my boss. I'm not going to help. I'm not going to step up. I'm going to be quiet or off-putting when really like what you're reacting to is actually your own story. So watch your assumptions. So that was that part. We're doing good on time. Good, good. So some mindful behaviors. So this is a muscle that has to be practiced over and over. And so of course what I'm presenting with you are ideals or guidelines. And they're all things that you're gonna have to pick and choose and figure out what is like the best ones to bring uh, into your practice from moment to moment. And there are ways to help make that a stronger mindful awareness. All right, so the four stages of action. So this is, kind of like a, a guideline again, or a plan that you can look at to understand how can I create space to be more mindful. So normally in a, in a process of action, we plan then execute, and maybe there's some reflection, but then we kind of start the wheel over again, where this idea asks us to slow down immediately afterwards, even before we reflect, to come to a calm, grounded space. 
so that we can even reflect with a little bit more grace, with a little bit higher of perspective. So yeah, I walk through each one of these. Okay, so um, plan, execute, transition, and reflect. Plan, of course, is just planning the action that you want to take. Execute is executing it once you've planned it. <laughs> and then the meat of it here is this transition point, where this is what we're not used to, is once we've done the thing, whatever we're doing, we want to stop. You want to be. The execution's done, the play is over, let's take some deep breaths and allow the nervous system to come into a place of harmony. Now this might be just a couple of deep breaths after a meeting, it might be, okay, you've made it to work and you're kind of frazzled because you were on BART or something and like, you know, it broke down and there was like a lot of craziness going on. Maybe, maybe you have to like sit down at your desk um, and just take a few deep breaths or like kind of just like be with yourself for a moment. And then once you've had that time and your nervous system's come back into a more equalized state, then you can reflect, appreciate, and analyze. So if this was like a, a project at work, you've planned, you've executed it, you've taken the time to like come down from it. And now you can look at it and you can see what happened, good, bad, or otherwise, from a higher perspective point. You, you'll make better decisions about how it might pr progress in the past or in the future, sorry. Um, and maybe even like who needs to be appreciated in the execution of this action. So plan, execute, take the time to transition. That's the mindful moment here is the transition point. And then you'll be able to reflect with a little bit more ease and you'll have more energy if you have to go right into a new project. Yeah, basically I just said all this. <laughs> Stopping during the transition phase allows your nervous system to reset which will allow you to reflect with a calmer and more grounded perspective. Mindful timing. So this is making sure you start and end meetings on time. I know it's hard, but we gotta do what we've gotta do. And we wanna make sure that we're being respectful of our time and of everybody one else's. So examples of mindful or mindful timing behavior is again, starting and stopping meetings on time, honoring your own downtime and holding boundaries of your time, especially if you are in a position of authority is you want to you want to mirror uh, model your own expectations of time that third one so like if you hold your boundaries with your calendar other people will do so as well now if you're in a more of a direct report role <laughs> you can still hold your boundaries and know what you need to keep yourself grounded and keep yourself uh, calm and able to keep on going good so some tips to stay mindful. There are many ways to be mindful. There's no one recipe that works for everybody. You wanna find out what really works well for you. So some ideas, you can of course take some ideas from what we've talked about today. So follow the four gates of communication whenever possible, kindness, truth, necessity, and timeliness. Um, there's self inquiry practices. This will help with understanding like your past and what you're reacting to. So things like therapy, coaching, meditation, yoga, journaling, these are all great practices to really understand like what is your story? What is my story here? Of course, there's self care, sleep, 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 please, please give yourself time to sleep, sleep. Retreat. Now to retreat is different from vacation. Vacation we tend, in this course before COVID, so like everything in context here, um, before quarantine. Retreat, it's good to take time away from your life that doesn't have to do with your life or is not a, an escape from your life. So pre-COVID, we would go to like Cancun and we'd be just as busy there as we are at home. We come back more tired than we started. Retreat is like, I think about like yoga retreats, it's my whole world, um, where you go somewhere or you take time and you go camping or something and you allow life to slow down and you allow your nervous system to come into equilibrium. So taking time away from your life is great. And that can be singular if you have that ability. It can be with a family or with friends. Um, exercise is a great way to help stay healthy and keep yourself in center. And then this last one's a big one, but a small one here is take nothing personally. Just as we've talked about owning your own story and knowing what you're reacting to, the same is true for everybody else, that everybody at the end of the day is reacting to their own suffering and their own internal conditioning. And so that begs a level of forgiveness if they are not as tactful as they could be. By all means, we don't have to put up with their stuff <laughs> for, you know, for too long, but we can know that it's not about us, that it's not personal. This is somebody else handling their own stuff 
skillfully or not skillfully. So just a quick review. We talked about whom I'm being versus what I'm doing. We talked about sensibilities and communication. So the four gates, uh, expectations versus realities, which included false projections and knowing our assumptions. And then mindful behavior, we talked about the four stages of action and making sure we have that transition time that we can build in. And then also including some mindful timing practices to make sure that we're staying in integrity of what we can actually handle from moment to moment. Cool. So I want to invite you to stay mindful with me if you'd like to. So I do teach a couple of weekly yoga classes on Zoom right now. And those are Mondays and Thursdays at 6 p.m. Pacific time. And you can check that out at uh, my website, jerrygibbons.net slash online yoga. Um, if you wanted to work on any of these concepts or any broader concepts around mindfulness or life in general, I do offer online coaching sessions right now. Um, we can process any blocks. We can get support for you. Um, and you can check that out at jerrygibbons coaching.com. And then I also have a bunch of free online meditations at Insight Timer. It's an app and you can just download the app. It's completely free and search my name. And of course, everything I do is found at my website, jerrygibbons.net. Cool. I think I was right on time with that one. <laughs> so I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Um, if anybody has any questions, um, feel free to ask them now. You can either unmute yourself or put it in the chat. I would love to, to answer any. You're welcome, Francis. That was great. Thank you. Yeah. Gary, I have a question. Yes, Donna. Um, I, I have a coworker that I work very closely with and um, I always feel like when we're in um, a meeting together with our supervisor, there's this competition that I feel she's giving me because she's trying to uh, one up, you know, every time I say something, mm -hmm. she wants to quickly say something, you know, and yeah. I, I kind of am on the defense every time I'm in this meeting with her because she's wanting to prove something to the supervisor. And um, I, I don't really know. I mean, I, 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 tend to back off and just let her talk, yeah. um, you know, because I feel anything I say, she's gonna, she's gonna say something to contradict it or to, you know, make herself look um, positive in the supervisor's eyes. And so I'm not really sure how to, you know, deal with that. Um, you know, I'm in a, a lead position in my office yeah. and a lot of times I do have to have you know, some difficult conversations. And so do you have any suggestions on how I should deal with the meeting process with her and still getting, you know, I, I liked the point that you made about, you know, only speak if you feel it's necessary. Yeah. Because this is one of those situations that there's a lot of things I'd love to say, but it's not going <laughs> to do any good. <laughs> Exactly. Th thank you for your question and thank you for the example. It's actually a really common one, um, I believe. I mean, having worked in business, I saw that come up quite a bit. Um, so just to reflect, you have a regular meeting with your boss and your coworker is with you and there seems to be this competition and she just inserts herself to try to one-up you and kind of take the, the thunder or take the spotlight away sometimes. And so with that specific instance, there's a couple of avenues you could, of course, go down. Um, one is to, if you feel confident and you feel like it would actually be effective, you could talk to your coworker directly and just like name, like, hey, I'm noticing they're like, I'm like on my side, like I'm feeling that there might be competition. Is that true for you? And they might say no, and maybe they're just more mindful and that could become more defensive. And at that point, you know that they're not really in space to hear you. You could also check in with yourself and say, okay, so I'm getting this projection that there's some competition. Is there any aspect of me that feels like I have to meet that competition, that I have to step up as well? Um, am I not being seen as effective by my boss in other ways? You know, is this the only moment that my, my worth can be shown to my boss here? And if the conflict were to progress further, there could always be just intervention where you speak to your boss singularly and say, something along the lines of like, hey, I feel this way sometimes when this happens. Um, I'm not sure if you've picked up on it, but here's kind of what's going on in my side. 
and maybe get their their feedback on that. Um, That's a good idea. I have done that somewhat and just mm -hmm. said, you know, obviously we don't necessarily agree on everything, um, you know, and yeah. That's a good idea. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. I hope that was helpful. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you, Donna. Any other questions or contributions? All right. Well, thank you so much for having me again, Aptus, Brooke. Um, I appreciate being here and uh, hope to see you all again soon sometime. Thank you, Jerry. That was fantastic. You're so welcome. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Jerry. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye, guys.